I think you may be seated. Now, the book of Nehemiah is only 13 chapters. It has 406 verses. I do this in my Sunday school class when we start a new book. And 10,483 words. And yes, we're going to get through all 10,483 of them. Not today. Amen. Now, I might say 10,483 words. It was written somewhere in the time of around 445, 440 B.C., the author of the book is clearly Nehemiah himself. The, the name Nehemiah means Jehovah comforts. And he is the son of Hakaliah. He was a prince in Judah and a remnant of the royal seed, if you'll remember, that was taken to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. He was also the cupbearer for the king of Persia, Artaxerxes. In Persia. He served as governor of Jerusalem after a man by the name of Zerubbabel that we would meet in the book of Ezra. Like Joseph in Egypt, like Obadiah in Samaria, like Daniel in Babylon, and like the saints in Caesar, Caesar's household in the book of Philippians chapter 4, Nehemiah had a place in the palace of Shushan. Now, Nehemiah left a life of luxury and security in the palace. He had a very cushy job. And he, he left that life for a life of toil and a life of danger to be with the people of God. Not since Moses have we met a man who gave up so much to devote himself to the service of the Lord. Moses, of course, also being in the palace of Pharaoh in Egypt being of royal lineage in Israel and serving in the high office next to the king in the palace in Shushan should have been anything that a person in his position as a Jew could ask for. But his heart was yearning for the ruined city of Jerusalem. Now the book of Nehemiah, I believe, has great truth for us, both in a historical way, a dispensational way, and a practical way. Historically, we understand that Nehemiah tells us of the change of power that was prophesied by Daniel the prophet in D Daniel chapter 2 with the image of Nebuchadnezzar. The world power would go now from Babylon to Medo-Persia, the emphasis being on the Persians. The book of Ezra begins with a decree of Cyrus, who is the king of Persia, to return God's people to Jerusalem to rebuild the house of God. And it chronicles the reestablishment of Judah's national calendar of feasts and, 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 and sacrifices. We learn of men like Zerubbabel and Joshua, not the Joshua, the book of Joshua, but a different Joshua who were, were in charge of the first return to rebuild the temple. The book of Ezra uh, gives us that glimpse. And then you have what we studied uh, several weeks ago, the book of Esther, that gives us a glimpse into the Jews living among the Persians in Persia. Nehemiah then chronicles the third return of the Jews to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. Rebuilding the walls of conquered cities would pose a problem for the king in charge of that city, thinking there might be a revolt. And so the king would only put someone in charge that he could trust. And he could trust Nehemiah. That's historical truth. Dispensational truth. When we read the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, Ezra and Nehemiah are, are describing for us prophetically what would happen again between 1917 and 1948. The reestablishing of the nation of Israel in the Middle East that we still see today. It is a great prophetic picture of that. Both books, for example, deal with the return of the Jews to Palestine before the times of the Gentiles are to be completed. These two books describe the first regathering, but the second regathering took place under a Gentile king. Oh, it wasn't the king of Persia, it was the king of England. And the king of England is a type of the king of Persia. Amazing. Exactly as it had taken place historically here. You say, well, that's all fine and good, but what does that mean to me? Practically, practically speaking, the book of Nehemiah gives us this great truth. Our theme verse for this year is found in Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse number 18 that says this, Then I told them of the hand of my God which was good upon me, 
as also the, the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, this is the people, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work, building, building up the walls. Well, the New Testament tells us that this is a great picture of building the church. Matter of fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 18, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock, what rock? That when, when Peter said thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We have the responsibility of building the church today as the body of Christ. Look over in, for example, Ephesians chapter two. It was a great segue into what we're talking about today, yesterday when we had the men's prayer breakfast over at Fig Tree. Uh, Brother Tim did a, such a great job talking about building the foundation, amen? And what a great turnout we had for our men. Well, we got one grunt, but I really got a lot out of it, Brother Tim. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 19, the Bible says, Now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household or God of God. Now watch this. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. I love this. I don't have to try to make something in the Old Testament applicable for the New Testament. Paul already told us that this is applicable. All scripture is given by expression and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. But we must only make analogies when the Bible tells us we can. We don't want to try to make something fit that doesn't fit. First Peter chapter 2 and verse number 5 says, Ye also. See, what are our building materials? Us. We are the building materials. We are living stones. He's, Peter says lively stones are built up in a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So God wants his church to rise up from sleep and to get to work to build the church in the way that he intends for it to be built while there is still time to build it. Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 14, it says this, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, rise up and build, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Nehemiah, in the physical picture of the spiritual reality of the New Testament church, went to the people and said, we need to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Today he is calling us in a picture, in an application that we are to build the church. And there are different ways that we build the church. And so what will it take for the church to say, let us say, let us rise up and build. And so I believe in Nehemiah we're going to learn just when that will take place. When will we as a church say it's time to rise up and build? Number one, I want you to see when we, when we care. When we care. That was really deep, wasn't it? When we care. Well, when Nehemiah cared about the condition of Jerusalem. Notice in verse number one of our theme text. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. And it came to pass in the month Chislu. Now there's some details here. He is, son, he is the son of Hakaliah, and the location and the time are given. It is in the month Chislu. This would be kind of our November, December. At Shushan, it says, I was in Shushan the palace. And Shushan, of course, is the capital city of the palace of the Persian king. And that's where he is. So it's our November, December. Here he is in the palace. He's in the 20th year of the Jews' captivity. And here he is. No doubt, it was just another normal day in the palace. He's living it up as the king's cupbearer. And the Bible says that Hanani, one of his brethren, and the Bible tells us over there in chapter 7, verse 2, that this is more than just a fellow Jew. This is his physical brother. 
And his brother and certain men of Judah had gone down to see the condition of Jerusalem. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar came in after the judgment of God, after the prophet's warnings over and over again that if Israel would not turn to God and instead worship idols, that he would send the Jews into captivity. And that's exactly what happened. The Assyrians came and took the northern kingdom. That's the, other, the top ten tribes. And the southern kingdom, uh, that would be Judah and Benjamin, were taken by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And the city of Jerusalem was laid waste. And so ever since then, they've been in captivity to Babylon and now Persia. Why would Nehemiah inquire, inquire about a remnant of people over here in Jerusalem? when he was having such a good time there in the palace. Isn't that something? He was the king's cupbearer. He was secure in his life. Well, there, there's more to life than just making sure you're secure. Certainly it wasn't his fault. We're going to find that Nehemiah was a great man of God. It wasn't his fault that Israel had been carried off into captivity. His ancestors did that. Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse number 5 tells us this, For who shall have pity upon thee, O Jerusalem? Or who shall bemoan thee? Or who shall go aside to ask how thou doest? Nehemiah did. Nehemiah did. He was the man that God had chosen to do the very things that Jeremiah was asking for. And so they give him the summation. Well, how is it down there? Well, okay. The remnant, verse 3, are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. I want you to think about that. The city, the city that was to display the glory of God and the power of God to the Canaanite nations because of sin now lied in waste. That great temple of Solomon that he had built, that he took so long to build, which was a physical picture, by the way, of the spiritual reality of the third heaven, that lied, that now was waste. It lied in waste. The gates are burned with fire, splintered, charred ashes. Can you imagine that just the beams now, maybe just... Uh, Charcoal, it looks like. Splintered, rot. Nehemiah asked about Jerusalem. He asked about the Jews there because he cared about how they were doing. American historian said this, uh, Henry Adams said this, practical politics consists in ignoring facts. I like that. But Aldous Huxley said this, Facts do not cease to exist because they are ignored. When we truly care about people, when we truly care, we want the facts no matter how painful it is. Let me tell you this. Some people don't want to know what's going on because information brings obligation. I want you just to think about that for a moment. What you don't know can't hurt you, is the old adage, right? In a letter to, to Mrs. Foote, Mark Twain wrote this, all you need in this life is ignorance and confidence, then su success is sure. <laughs> what did Nehemiah learn about Jerusalem and the Jews? Three words, remnant, ruin, reproach. That's what he hears. Instead of, uh, of a land inhabited by a great nation, Israel, only a remnant of people now live there. They were in great affliction and struggling to survive. Instead of a, a magnificent city, Jerusalem was in shambles. And when there had once been great glory that manifested the glory of God, there was nothing now but reproach. That's what was there. And so how did Nehemiah react? Verse 4, And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted. But I love this. He wanted to do something about it. He prayed. He prayed. Nehemiah was affected by the, 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 the pain of others. Reminds me of what Paul said over there in the book of Romans, chapter 15 and verse number 3. For even Christ pleased not himself... But as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. Wow. 
The book of Nehemiah begins with great affliction there in Nehemiah 1.3. But before it closes, over there in chapter 8, there is great joy. I was reminded of Psalm 30 in verse number 5. You know this verse, for his anger endureth but a moment, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Amen. And Nehemiah is a great picture of that. Do you know when we'll begin to, to, to rise up and build our church? Do you, do you realize the time that we'll do that? When we will invite people to come and be a part of what God's doing here? When we start caring. That's when. When we actually care, when we come across people all day long, every day of the week, that may be dying and going to hell without Jesus. When we actually start caring about that, We'll go seek them to bring them into the Lord's house. Not only that, when we'll start caring about the spiritual stagnation of people who are in the wrong church. Oh yeah, there's a right church and there's a wrong church. A wrong church is one that does not preach the Bible. Oh, that's a wrong church. I don't know if you know that or not. When we start caring about that, when we start caring about the impact that Charity Baptist Fellowship will make in this community. Last week, someone came uh, to, to, to the office here and I was talking with them. And they said this, I don't even know really anything's going on over here. I pass this place all the time. That's what they said to me. Right? When we start caring about the impact that charity can have on Clayton County, on Jonesboro, on Stockbridge, on McDonough, on Hampton, Right? then we'll start building the church. It's all about caring. We get so caught up in our own life, we all do it. And, and we're too uh, tunnel vision on what we need to accomplish and then get back in our car and go home. When do you realize that every single day when we go out, there are people that have come across our path that God may want us to invite to church? What are we afraid of? It's an amazing thing. Well, I'm afraid of offending people. Well, we're sure not worried about offending people when they get the wrong order at our restaurant. We don't mind offending whoever we need to offend. When we're at their Verizon store and our phone's acting up, we don't mind offending them. So you know what it is? It's just a cop-out. We care more about getting our phone and getting our money's worth than we do inviting people to come to church. I say I'm wrong. It's the truth. There are things that we care about that we shouldn't care about. I'm in the car with my kids and my wife. And I have this horrendous pet peeve in the vehicle. It is very difficult to ride with me. And, uh, and I, bet, I bet my wife could, could name exactly what it is. It is this. I do not understand how every time I can make a slight turn, something falls over in the car. It's like we are just sitting on top of piles of stuff. And I make a right turn. And everything just starts falling over here. Then I turn. Up, I can't stand it. We have in our car, we have those mats, you know, that are rubber that keeps everything. In it doesn't matter. I can't take it. Listen, it's so bad. Y'all got to pray for me. As I get older, my ways are becoming worse. But I could, you know, I was in the car today. My wife has this, you know, shocker. She has this amazing cup. She loves cups, you know. And so she has this amazing Starbucks cup, you know. And I promise you, every time I would make any sort of slight turn, the straw, the pla she can't have just a normal plastic straw. You know, it's, it's a hard, it's a metal straw. It would clink, 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 clink. I'm just, I'm just like this, twitching, you know. <laughs> there are some things that we care about that we shouldn't care about. I should not care that every time I move, I feel like the car's about to flip over because there's so much stuff, you know, in our car. But there are certainly things we should care about. Amen. And Nehemiah cared. Nehemiah cared and we're about to find out how much he cared. So when we rise up and build, we care. We need to care. You know what I think sometimes? Let me share this with you. I believe sometimes we have it so good here. I don't think sometimes we realize how good we have it here. We are like a family. And I, I, I cannot tell you how much I love 
you, and I love being in this church. Every person here, even the ones that get on my nerves. <laughs> yeah? And I think sometimes we have it so good that we really don't want to add anybody that can mess it up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Some of y'all don't want to invite people because you're afraid they're going to stay. I get it. I really do. <laughs> but, but here's the problem. Here's what you don't consider. That when they come, the Holy Spirit of God can change them from the inside out. We just have to care. We just have to care enough. You understand what I'm saying. When will we rise up and build when we care? And I want you to see, secondly, when we confess. When we confess. Uh, this, this is one of the most amazing prayers you'll ever read in the Scriptures. When Nehemiah, look at verse number 4, when, he, when he's weeping and mourning, when he hears about the condition of Jerusalem. Notice what, it, what he says. He fasted, mourned certain days, and he prayed before the God of heaven. This prayer is the first of 12 different prayers that's found in 13 chapters of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a man who prayed to God. The book of Nehemiah, matter of fact, opens up in prayer, and at the end of Nehemiah, it closes in prayer. And he's a man of faith who depends wholly on the Lord to help him accomplish the work which he knew he was called to do. I like what the Scottish novelist George MacDonald said. He said, in whatever man does without God, he must fail miserably or succeed more miserably. Man, I like that. If we desire God to build our church then we need to do it God's way. Can we get a crowd here? We could get a crowd here. We could do it real easy. Next week, we're going to give everybody a $50 bill just for showing up. <laughs> hey, do you not believe we'd pack this place out next week? Oh, yeah, we could build a church. But we're not building it God's way. Notice the prayer begins. I, I love this. This is such a great example of how we should pray. The first thing that he does is he acknowledges how great God is. He begins with praise to God. I love this. Now, when your kids begin to praise you, know they're about to ask you for something. <laughs> Amen. Caroline was following me around the other day. Amen. I was like, wow, this is amazing. My oldest daughter, I mean, she's, she's going on 15 years old. She's wanting to hang out with her dad. And then a little bit, and then I go, what's wrong? <laughs> you know? She began to ask me. No, I'm just kidding. She does. She hangs out with me. But I want you to think about this. He praised God for who he is. The God of heaven. The God of heaven. That term in the scripture is an amazing term. Ezra used it often in the scriptures. It's found four times in, Jeremiah, in, in Nehemiah. It's found three times in the book of Daniel. To what kind of a God do we pray? The God of heaven. You know, the Bible says that his ways are higher than our ways. Because he sits higher than we sit. And I love what he calls him here, the great and terrible God. The great and terrible God. He said, what does terrible mean? Full of terror. The fact of who God is should be terrible to us. Full of terror. That we should ever offend the God of heaven. That's okay, by the way, to think of God in that way. Right? You know one of the reasons why kids don't respect their parents? They don't fear them. They don't fear the consequences. Yeah? If you're experiencing great affliction, like he says in verse number 3, and are about to undertake a great work, like he says in chapter 4 and in chapter 6, then you're going to need great power, like in chapter 1, verse number 10, great goodness, like chapter 9, and great mercy. Isn't that amazing? Of who? A great God. So think about this. Is the God that you worship big enough to handle all the challenges that you face to serve the Lord? The greater part of Nehemiah's prayer was devoted to the confession of sin. He hadn't even asked God to do anything yet. Notice in verse number 6, Let thine ear now be attentive, and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now day and night for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. The greater part of Nehemiah's prayer, notice that he doesn't say them. 
talking about Israel. But he says, we, we. It, it reminded me of Daniel's prayer there in Daniel chapter 9 and verse number 8. Let's look at it. Daniel chapter 9 and verse number 8, when he's also confessing to God. And in verse number uh, 8, he says this, O Lord, to us belongeth confusion to face, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgivenesses, through we, though we have rebelled against them. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yet all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. I, I want you to notice that Nehemiah is doing the same thing Daniel is. He's not saying, oh, because all the sins of Israel, like, we have sinned. We are not righteous. Now, of the, the four great rep repentant prayers in Scripture are Daniel 9, Psalm 51 with David when he got caught with Bathsheba, Ezra chapter 9, and Nehemiah chapter 1. Notice two important words that Nehemiah uses in the text. Sins and sinned. Now we know in the New Testament, according to 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 17, that all unrighteousness is sin. Yes, we know that. We know that in the New Testament dispensation, there is no distinction between sinners and the righteous. Because the Bible says that there is no difference. In Romans chapter 3, in verse number 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In the New Testament, we know there is no difference. But it, here's why this prayer is so striking to me. In the Old Testament dispensation, there is a difference between sinners and the righteous between the righteous and the wicked. And what's amazing to me is that before the New Testament dispensation, Nehemiah lumps himself in with a group of sinners. What kind of sinners? Well, in a murderer like Cain, because he's called a sinner, in Genesis chapter 4, in verse number 17, and Cain knew his wife, she conceived and bare Enoch, and he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. We understand and know. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't think that was the right verse. Let's go. That didn't make any sense. Let's look over. It is Cain. But let's look in Genesis chapter 4. I believe it's verse number 7. Yes. If thou doest well, this is what the Lord is saying to Cain. Thou shalt not be accepted. Shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. What was Cain? Cain was a murderer. Nehemiah says, I'm no better than him. What about Genesis 13, 13? That happens to have 13 uh, words in the verse. And the first time we ever see the word wicked and sinners in the verse, and they just add up to be 13 letters. Hmm, amazing. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Nehemiah grouped himself in with Cain the murderer and the Sodomites of Sodom and Gomorrah. Nehemiah said, we've sinned. We're sinners. Isn't that amazing? See, here's the thing. One of the reasons the burden is not there to build the church today is because Christians no longer have a biblical view of themselves when it comes to sin. They just, it's no longer sin, it's mistakes, lack of judgment, error in logic. Oh, we've got to learn the hard way. Yeah. Accidentally causing unrest to other individuals. Right? There's not a sinner in the bunch in New Testament Christianity today. In the Bible, sin is called vomit. Sin is called wounds. Sin is called chains, and sin is called leprosy. That's what the Bible calls sin. And nobody but sinners inhabit this earth right now. You and me both. All, all have sinned. 
So when you get rid of words like damned and hell and sin and sinners, you get rid of the Bible. Why? Because the word sin occurs 570 times and 40 out of the 66 books of Scripture contain the word sin. And so I want you to see here that after recognizing Nehemiah's own sinfulness, then Nehemiah says, we are all sinners, we have all sinned, but Lord, do you remember that you said that if we sinners would turn back to you, you would deliver us from our captivity. He began to remember books of, uh, like Deuteronomy and Leviticus that promised that if they would turn back to God from their wicked ways, the same God of the Old Testament as the God of the New Testament, he would forgive them of their sin and restore them just like today. Nehemiah knew, look at what it says, I love this. Verse number eight of Nehemiah one. Remember I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses saying, if ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast into the uttermost part of the, of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Nehemiah understood that the word of God tells us that God is going to one day destroy Babylon. He's going to destroy Persia. He's going to destroy Greece. He's going to destroy uh, Rome. He's going to destroy the, the UN. He's going to destroy all the Gentile nations of the world, but he will preserve the nation of Israel. Jeremiah 30 verse 11. For I am with thee, say the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations. Whether I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. But I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse number 8 gives us this promise. Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms and pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Zechariah 14, 2 says this, For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the cities shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the cities shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. In chapter 12 and verse number 3, it says this, And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. God said... Judgment is coming on all of the Gentile nations, but Israel shall remain. Nehemiah knew that promise. So here's another example of Nehemiah just believing, a man of God just believing what God said from God's own words. And that gave him the power to ask God, to ask God to deliver Israel. 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 8 is a great picture of what Nehemiah is going through here. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, isn't that wonderful? That's what Nehemiah was doing. He is faithful. And I love this name. Just. To forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And in verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him, God, a liar, and his word is not in us. Nehemiah knew that his people were suffering because of their sin. We will want to build the church when we recognize the gravity of our sin. And notice this, ours first. Our sin first. I'm reminded of Luke chapter 15. Do you remember in verse number 21? The son that had run from his father, a great picture there. And the son had said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. Look at this. And am no more worthy to be called thy son. Nehemiah said, I know that Israel has sinned. I know that we have sinned against you. And so what, what does the father do here in Luke chapter 15? Oh, let's, let's kill the fatted calf. 
Let's have a feast. My son was dead, but now he's alive. Confess. Do you know how healthy confession of our sin is in our spiritual walk? Do you know how healthy it is for us? The Bible even says for us to confess our faults one to another. The Bible tells us the benefit of that. We think of confession. I was, I was laughing the other day. We, uh, Caroline was sick and she having a rough time. Threw up everywhere. Except in the one place she should throw up. It wasn't her fault. It was kind of funny. Not at the time. But uh, if you know what I've been doing, it, we've, been, we've been moving rooms around and everybody now has got their own room and, and Caroline is now in a room above the garage and, and so we, we couldn't just let her have it. We had to repaint everything and reseal everything and so it was just a long process. We got all, everything painted, took another coat. It was just, it was a nightmare getting all this together. You couldn't see, the lighting wasn't good. I'm up on ladders, I'm propped up trying to get these little spots. I mean, it's crazy. We finally got it done. Sunday night. I'm going to sleep. I'm so excited. I'm thinking, man, I finally got a day off. It was the Super Bowl party. Everything was great. Three in the morning, my oldest daughter comes into our bedroom, and I just, I, you know how you can just feel people's presence? Somebody's here, you know. Of course, you wake up, Katie, you know. <laughs> and uh, Caroline never comes in our room for anything. She does, she, she's very self, she's like her mom. She's very self-sufficient. And she comes in, and she's like, I threw up. And we're like, okay, are you okay? She's, I, I didn't make it. I'm like, oh no. And I'm just, I'm so, oh no. So sure enough, not on, not on the wood floors, not on the wood paneling, where it's easy to clean up. Not on the tile, easy to clean up. On that, just oh, I don't know, four square feet of carpet. She has her door closed. And she does, she's trying to open the door everywhere. She doesn't make it. It go. I've never seen. It's like she, could, she couldn't aim any better. There's a, there's a little sliver of drywall that goes between the door frame and the, and the adjacent wall. She got it all in there. Amazing. So at three in the morning, I, I don't mean to gross you guys out. Sorry. So at three in the morning, we're, we're scrubbing. I was going somewhere with this. Where was I going? Oh, yeah. And so, so she's sick at home. And so uh, we, we had to go do some running around. And, of course, Caroline is old enough now. We let her stay for, you know, brief periods of time. And so we just wanted Maddie to stay with her so that just in case Caroline needed anything that Maddie could go get it for her. And so then we start getting the third degree from Madeline. And so she's like, can I come? No, Madeline, we need you to stay just in case Caroline needs anything. She goes, if you go to Starbucks, can I have something? No, you cannot have anything from Starbucks. We need you to stay. This is what she said. And right before we left, so am I in charge? No, you're not in charge. <laughs> she was just hoping that for once she got to tell her older sister what to do. Amen. <laughs> when will we rise up and build? When we care? When we confess? And I want you to see finally today when we commit. When we commit, Nehemiah cared about the situation. He cared so much that he asked about it with his cushy life. Then he goes to God and fasts and prays. And then he doesn't say, oh, Lord, please let somebody rise up to take this big job. No, he says, I'll do it. Look at verse number 10. Now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant. Isn't that good? I'm here, Lord, to serve. I'm asking you for me. Not for anybody else. I'm the servant. And to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy. I just love this. In the sight of this man. Because he was the king's cupbearer. So obviously, we see what's happening here. Nehemiah already hasn't worked out what he's going to do. He's going to ask the king if he can go to Jerusalem. That's what that plan is. So he's asking, Lord, I'm committing my life to you right now. Please don't let me die 
when I ask the king something he may not like. That's what's happening here. So I want you to look at this. When Nehemiah was praying, the burden from Jerusalem became greater. His vision, I believe, already was becoming clearer. That's what prayer does, by the way. Prayer is not only, uh, we think of prayer like we're doing God some favor. No, the words that we say, that we're communicating to God, helps our spiritual life just as much. And so what is happening here, I believe that while Nehemiah is communicating with God the burden of his heart, it begins to balance his heart and his head. You know, because it's not that Nehemiah has a heart burden for Jerusalem and then he sneaks away and runs for his life so he can get there. Now God's dealing with his head. Here is the plan on how to make this happen. Isn't that good? I believe that as we pray, God will tell us what to do through his word, not through some weird, still, small voice in a cave like Elijah, by the way. We hear that all the time from this book, from his word. He begins to communicate scripture to us to tell us what to do, when to do it, how to do it. And right here, Nehemiah plans to volunteer to go to Jerusalem to supervise the rebuilding of the walls. Because he knows that the king is not going to go for it and just allow the Jews to willy-nilly build up a city again. Because they've been in captivity. And what is the king going to think? They're going to get big again and turn on us. So Nehemiah knows that the only way the king is going to agree to this is if he sends somebody that he can trust, which would be him. Isn't that wonderful? He didn't pray to God to rise up somebody else. He didn't argue that he was ill-equipped, that all he is is a cupbearer, right? He had the confidence in God that he would raise up himself and other servants that will get on board for the work. That he would rally the cause. He knew that he was about to have to approach the king and request an extended leave of absence. Notice he's the king cupbearer. That really comes into play next week. A cupbearer was so much more than a butler, if you will. A cupbearer was a position of great responsibility and privilege. And the fact that a Jew was chosen as cupbearer to the Persian king whom Persia had conquered Israel says something about the character of this man, Nehemiah. Because what is a cupbearer? Well, at each meal, the cupbearer would test the king's drink to make sure it wasn't poison. <laughs> so a man that stood that close to the king not only had to have the right character, you know, he also had to have the right outward appearance. He had to be handsome, he had to be cultured, he had to be knowledgeable in court procedures, and he had to be able to converse with the king and advise him as well if he asked. That's why if you remember that you got some of the servants of the king of Pharaoh back there in Genesis that went to prison because they said something he didn't like. And so this was an important position. What if he didn't trust the cupbearer? Look, can you imagine how easy is it? Mm, that's good. It's like my kids when we asked him to get one more drink. Right? Mmm, that's good. Did you drink it? Really? Right? Yeah, that's great, King. Go ahead. And he drops over and dies. Right? That would benefit someone who is in captivity, wouldn't it? So he had to trust him with his, with his life. Further, what we're going to find in chapter 2 is that there is a Persian law. That anybody in the presence of a Persian king, or, and really many, any other in the Orient there, had to be sure that they were cheerful people. Do you know that? You had to smile. And you could not be depressed when you were in the king's presence. So this Wednesday night, we are going to incorporate a new rule here at Charity. <laughs> you cannot be depressed in my presence. All right? And you can't depress me. I don't need any help from any of you. Somebody else say, you just called yourself a king. Well, the king's cupbearer would have to sacrifice his position. This is an honorable position. This is a life of luxury that he is in. And he's about to have to give up his comfort and security for the rigors and dangers ahead that he will face. In chapter 2, we already have opposition. Luxury would be replaced by ruins. Prestige would be replaced by ridicule and slander. This is what we're going to find that Nehemiah is up against. Instead of sharing the king's bounties, 
Nehemiah would have to personally pay out of his own pocket the upkeep of scores of people who would eat at the table. That's what Nehemiah is going through. He would have to leave behind the ease of a palace and take up the toils of encouraging already a beaten down people and finishing almost an impossible task. We find that over and over in the Word of God, that men of God who care about God, who care about how God looks in the eyes of a nation, were willing to do whatever it took to make God look to be the great power that He is. If you'll remember, Abraham went and took his men and delivered Lot from Sodom. Moses delivered the Israelites out of Egypt. David brought the nation uh, and the kingdom back to the Lord. Esther risked her own life to save her nation from genocide. Paul preached the gospel throughout the Roman Empire and ultimately gave his life at the hands of, of Nero, the, the king. And let us not forget that none of that would have taken place had our greatest example not been there. The Lord Jesus Christ dying on the cross of Calvary, leaving the throne room of heaven so that you and I might be saved. Wow. Wow. God, I believe, still uses people like Nehemiah who cares enough to hear the facts, who weeps over the needs, who prays for God's help to accomplish in them what God wants them to do. We'll build the church if we're willing to, to let the buck stop here. And instead of praying that everybody else will do good, we'll be the ones. Do you remember over there in Isaiah chapter 6 when Isaiah just got a glimpse of God, of the throne room. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And the Lord asked this question, Who shall I send? Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And you remember what Isaiah said there in chapter 6, verse 8. Here am I. Send me. It's not everybody else's job to, to let us rise up and build. It's our job. So when will we do it? Well, when we start caring... When it, when it matters to us, when we confess, when we realize the severity of what sin is doing, and then we'll commit. We'll say, we'll do it. And you know, all those things that we believe that, that we have to, to surrender for the service of the Lord, if we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, do you know that all those things will be added unto us anyway? Yeah. It's an amazing thing. But we try to do the opposite. We want to take care of our stuff first as the kingdom of God lies waste. But if we'll seek first the kingdom of God, then He will take care of everything else according to His riches and glory. But it's just a matter of trust. Do we trust Him that much? Do we really trust the God of heaven, the great and terrible God that Nehemiah worshipped? Heavenly Father, we thank You.